Rodney Stark is a sociologist, a professor of sociology, and he looked at the sociological factors strictly as to why Christianity experienced such an incredibly rapid growth in the early church. He writes that in the time of the plagues, what was prudent for most people was to flee. But prudence for Christians meant something different. Prudence for Christians meant that they stayed to care for the sick who were too sick to flee. It meant they cared for everybody they could. It was found that because of this, Christianity grew rapidly during the plagues. Christians survived better. And those who were cared for by Christians ended up converting to Christianity through the love they received. So I dreamt the other night of my spouse. He was in the form by which he has chosen to give himself to me on this earth. He was in the form of bread. In the dream, I was looking at him in the Blessed Sacrament and longing, but not able to receive him. But much deeper than this longing I have is a deep thanksgiving for our hero priests who every day throughout the world are celebrating the sacrifice of the Mass. And through the sacrifice, they renew the face of the earth and they renew each of us. Thanksgiving is deep. But in this time of longing, of longing for people's safety, of longing for a secure job to keep a living, of longing for the Blessed Sacrament, we need more than ever to see Jesus with clear vision. Not to see him with our eyes, but to see him with much more advanced seeing organs, to see him with our mind and with our heart. We need the cardinal virtue of prudence to see Jesus gives us faith. We need the cardinal virtue of prudence elevated and informed by the supernatural virtue of faith. We need to believe in God. According to St. Augustine, prudence is love, choosing wisely between that which helps and that which hinders us in reaching God. It is a decision. But to choose wisely first means to see what to choose and to make a decision based on that sight. How do we get this sight? How do we receive this inward vision? According to St. Augustine, he continues, if virtue leads us to the happy life, then I would not define virtue in any other way than as the perfect love of God. To see inwardly is to know the perfect love of God and to love God. St. Cardinal Newman tells us how our love for God grows. He writes, we cannot love God unless we have heartfelt gratitude to him. And we cannot duly feel gratitude unless we feel keenly what he has suffered for us. May God give us the grace right now, here and now, to learn to love him ever more passionately, to feel keenly what he has suffered for us. We enter into the suffering of Jesus on Holy Thursday. We enter into the Garden of Gethsemane. Now we know <laughs> that there is an infinitely more deadly pestilence that has infected each of us, all of humanity, the pestilence of sin which kills the soul, which is why God became man to battle this pestilence. In the Garden of Eden, the Lord God warned Adam, you shall not eat, you shall die. He warned him not to eat of the tree. You shall not eat, you shall die. Adam's decision is death. Scripture says, and he ate. Adam ate death through disobedience. But now, Holy Thursday, Jesus is the new Adam. He's in a new garden, and the human will makes a new decision. Through obedience, Jesus drinks the cup of Adam's death and the death of every person after him. Jesus asks us to be with him in the garden, just as he begged his disciples to keep watch with him. Pope Francis, when at Gethsemane, said, we tread softly as we enter that inner space. 
where the destiny of the world was decided. As we enter, we hear Jesus say to his disciples, pray that you may not enter into temptation. He withdrew from them about a stone's throw and knelt down and prayed. In the account of Matthew and Mark, he falls on his face. He cries out, my soul is sorrowful even unto death. Jesus cries out to the Father, Father, if thou art willing, remove this cup from me. In this cup, Jesus receives the sin, every sin, and every sin's torturous effects into himself. In his humanity, he can refuse this cup. He trembles, he, we hear his frightened cries, we see his terrified sweat. At the sight, Benedict XVI cries out in us with him, have mercy, Father, for my sin was present in that terrifying chalice. His love for us, says St. Pio, tears his heart in the garden more than the scourge will soon tear his flesh. Luke records that Jesus, being in agony, prayed the more earnestly, and his sweat became as great drops of blood. We see in the agony of Christ that our sin and death do not just disappear. They are not without consequence. But we see, as we look upon Jesus in the garden and on the cross, that he has taken the consequence upon himself. And so he cries out to the Father, nevertheless, not my will, but thine be done. His human will in fear and sweating blood wills to submit to his Father. And we all now have the method and the response to every fear. And being in agony, he prayed the more earnestly. And not my will, but thine be done. It says Jesus rose from prayer. The word is the one in the Greek for resurrection. Jesus rose from prayer, ready. He drank my sin, my death. I can live, you can live. <laughs> We see how God has fashioned for us marvelous human wills. Maximus the Confessor affirms Christ's fear of death, a sign of his true humanity, as integral to his voluntary submission to the will of the Father, aimed at modeling for us self-sacrifice and encouraging us, encouraging those who face death, who confront death through obedience. Is this not who we are as Christians, as followers of Christ? People who confront death on the basis of our obedience to the new covenant. Obedience to our baptism into the covenant of sacrificial love. Jesus took, drank the cup of our sin. And in return, he gives us the cup of his life of his love, he gives us the cup of his blood, of our salvation. He says, this cup which is poured out for you is the covenant in my blood. In covenant, we are bound together forever. Nothing can separate us from the love of God in Christ Jesus our Lord. He's just so incredible. What he takes and what he gives right now we care for people all over the world who are suffering, worrying about how they're going to provide for their families, who are sick, who are dying, perhaps who are dying without faith and, and without hope, perhaps in fear. Right now, we care for them by surrendering our will to the Father in the garden of our homes. In the garden, Jesus saved every man, cared for every man, took every man's infinite pestilence upon himself by surrendering his will to the Father. We as Christians do our part. Mother Teresa of Kolkata Saint writes, true love is surrender. The more we love, the more we surrender. If we really love souls, she writes, we will be ready to take their place. 
we will be ready to bear their sin. The person who has shown me this the clearest in my life, which I'd like to share with you because we are family. <laughs> I feel that so much in this time. We are a great family made in the image of God. The person who has shown me this the clearest is my brother, Troy. My cousin, Lynette, said that when her and Troy were little, uh, they'd be playing in grandpa's fields and Troy would kneel down to pray. <laughs> Sometimes she said at length. <laughs> <clears throat> he was a normal boy. I'm sure I still probably know every single word of Abba's greatest hits potentially because he had made a cassette of it and I listened to it and I think until it broke. He was a normal boy who prayed. When Troy was 13, he was diagnosed with a brain tumor. He suffered immensely, terrible headaches. Um, Mom says he, he can't remember him ever complaining. The tumor was removed and the doctor said that after the surgery, if he lives two years, he will live a normal life. It was near the end of the two years, he was cleared, even by the doctors to, to go and play soccer again. When he was babysitting us, his younger siblings, one evening, when my brother Carl had a grand mal seizure. Afterwards, Troy told mom, if anyone is to have brain problems in this family, I would rather it be me. The power of a decision. In short time, his headaches returned. And my dad said that he went to his room to tell him the results of the scan. My dad said, I broke down and I cried. And it was he who consoled me. He said, I wanted to tell him gently. I wanted to tell him in a gentle way. I wanted to be gentle, but it was him who consoled me. Troy loved school and was a brilliant student, but he watched as he could no longer concentrate. His journal entries are just heartrending. At his anointing of the sick, which was at our home, after the prayers for healing, the adults were talking together when Troy said quietly, spontaneously, I don't know what God's will is for me, but I do know it will be the best for me. That was on Wednesday. On Thursday, he woke up and he was setting the table and he told mom, I guess I wasn't healed because I can't see the cutlery. He wanted to go to school so badly, but he had to come home from school. On Friday, he went into the hospital and on Saturday, he died. My brother Carl, after his death, his seizure stopped. We grew up with Troy's words and his picture in the most prominent place of our house always before us. I don't know what God's will is for me, but I do know it will be the best for me. In this big family we have around the world, may we say, if anyone is to suffer in this family, I would rather it be me. This is a short time to imitate Christ in his outpouring of love. And we see how he loves us so much. I love him so much. Because of his love and his decision in the garden, my brother Troy lives. I firmly believe that. Joseph Pieper says that prudence is eyes wide open objectivity, to see things as they really are. We see in Christ that ultimately the will of the Father is that we be with him forever. And it doesn't get any better than that. God bless you.